Hey everybody, my name is Anna, aka Glitter and Lasers, and welcome back to my channel. And if you're new here, hello! Today we're gonna be talking about when I first moved to New York and all the things I learned when I was young, broke, and kind of stupid. Because I made a lot of mistakes and I also learned a ton. And I feel like I get tons of questions about like, how do you get into a career? How do you like survive in New York City? And I'm like, I got you. So today we're gonna do a mini story time where I tell you five stories about a lot of first experiences that I had in New York. Now, if you like this video, please let me know in the comments because this is something totally new for me. And also, if you really like the video, you should be subscribed to my channel, click that like button and turn on the notification bell. So without further ado, let's learn all about my first time in New York. moved to New York, I did not actually have a job. I was an intern at an advertising agency on Madison Avenue, and I lived in a really special place called the I House. Now the I House is this wonderful kind of housing situation created by the Rockefellers that brings in students from all over the world to live in one place. And the idea here is that they can all learn to be leaders and, and understand different cultures better. And it was awesome. I met so many people from so many different places and learned a lot about my own bias and my own like prejudices living in such a diverse place and Honestly, I have nothing but fond memories. It was also set up in this beautiful area of Morningside Heights, which is what Columbia likes to call Harlem. So it sounds a little bit fancier, but it's mostly just like Harlem, but also where Columbia is. And this neighborhood had all kinds of like memorials and cute parks, but exceptionally, there was also tons of dogs. There were always dogs to chase and pet. And this is really where my dog obsession started was living in the eye house and walking out those doors and petting all of those dogs. Now, what I remember most about living in the eye house is like how long it took me to get to my internship. So to get to my internship, I would literally have to walk out the door of the eye house down like a ton of steps, then I would take the steps down a hill, and then I would go up an escalator to a platform where I would take a train, then I would switch to another train, then I would switch to another train, and then I would be at my job, which I would actually have to walk from <laughs> the station about another quarter of a mile to the door. And that the process wasn't necessarily that hard, but it was very long. And it's funny because when I look back at that time, there's one thing I remember, which is how tired I was. So this entire time that we've been traveling up here, I've been telling John there was this hill that I had to walk up and it was so exhausting. And every day when I would come home, I would just be so daunted by this hill. And we got here and we saw the hill and it's not that bad. <laughs> Like in my mind, it was this huge obstacle, but in real life, it's just this tiny hill. And I'm kind of embarrassed, but I think it, I think it makes a lot of sense because it puts everything in perspective. And I guess that's what, I, what I'm realizing right now in this moment is like, for me, it was really hard at the time. And now, not so much, but I was also working full time, going to grad school, it was a lot. It was really interesting going back to this location because I realized Everything seemed a lot harder than maybe it was, but in the context of my life and all of the things that were going on, it seemed really, really hard. But what I remember from this time, more than anything, more than how long it took me to get to work or how special it was to live in a diverse community, was how new and fresh and exciting everything felt. I remember when I first went to Times Square, looking around and being like, oh, magical. Now in a couple of years, when I was a seasoned New Yorker, I was like, Times Square, Ugh. Like I never would go there, I would avoid it like the plague. But when you're new and in New York, there's a certain magic that comes from being in Times Square and being surrounded by the people and the lights and just realizing that you're in the city you always dreamed of living and that magic can never be replaced for me. When I look at the most magical times in my life, that moment, that first day or couple of days in New York is really the most magical time in my life. And I think this is a good proxy for a lot of things because when you want to do something, 
oftentimes the most exciting things in your life will also be the hardest things in your life. So when I look back at that time, I remember how long it took to get to work. I remember how hard everything seemed, but I also remember how magical it was. So when I look back at that time, it's interesting that there's such a dichotomy in my memories of, yeah, it sucked, but wow, I'm in the most magical place on the earth. And I think that's the first thing I would say to anyone who's looking to take a new adventure or a new trip in their life, it's to know that it's gonna be hard, but ultimately worth all the excitement and joy and magic you're going to experience. So once I realized I wanted to live in New York, I actually needed to get a permanent job, right? Because I was just interning and I was an unpaid intern for that matter. So I was also very broke. So I needed to get paid. And getting a job in New York City at the time that I was looking was really hard. There was kind of an economic decline. There were not a lot of places with opening spots. Everybody wanted an intern because back in that time, you could still hire people for free and no one would look down on you. So everybody had interns, but actually getting a job was really hard. So here's what I did. I hustled and I didn't just hustle. I was smart about it. So every day I would walk the office and I didn't know who you were or what you did. I would ask if you needed help to every single person until someone was like, yeah, can you do this annoying task I don't wanna do? And I'd be like, yes. And I would put on this bright face and I'd be like, of course I wanna do this terrible task. Nothing would make me happier, sir or ma'am. I would love to do it. And I would do it and I would do it phenomenally well. And I did this over and over and over. So when I was hustling, I would go to the park, I would go to Central Park and I would walk around and I would think of ideas and brainstorm ways to get myself involved in the business as much as possible. Like, how could I help this person? How could I do this task? And really the park became my second office where I would just think and kind of ponder about how to help others. Not only did I do a lot of stuff where I learned a ton, because most of the times I was saying yes to doing things I had no clue how to do, but I met people from the art department. I met people from the uh, uh, finance department. I met people from the sales team. I met people from the data team. Everybody knew who I was. And everybody's interactions with me boiled down to, that's the girl who did something I didn't want to do. What ended up happening is, is I did get a job offer for significantly less than would be required to live in Boston, where I would also have to move. So it was just like a no-win scenario. But I was able to go in and say, hey guys, this has been a really great internship. I'm gonna have to end my internship early because I have this job, I'm gonna have to take it. And immediately panic went through everybody's mind because all they could think about was the fact that I was doing and doing very well all the things they hated in their jobs, like literally hated. So all of a sudden, all these people who had been utilizing my extra time, which as an intern you have plenty of, were advocating for me to be hired simply so they wouldn't have to do the things in their life that they absolutely hated. So what I learned from this experience is, if you want someone to advocate for you in business, if you want someone to fight for you and to make space for you where there may not be space, the best way you can do it is by helping them do their job and recognizing what they don't want to do and becoming very efficient at it. I ended up getting hired. I ended up in a role that I loved with a manager I loved because I got to pick pretty much which team I ended up on because everybody wanted me because nobody wanted to do their grunt work. And as an intern, doing your grunt work actually is extremely helpful because I learned so much, more than I ever learned in college, if we're honest. I mean, I learned new software, I learned new technology, I learned new approaches. I also was in meetings as an intern because I had done the PowerPoint. Someone had to present it. I learned and grew so much during my internship, doing all the things people hated, which honestly were the best things for me to do at that point. So everybody won and I got my first job. So if you're looking to get hired somewhere, if you're in the same spot I was, hustle, make yourself indispensable. Tell people that you are there and ready to do the stuff they don't wanna do. And you'll be surprised how much you'll be able to learn, grow, and probably land a job. So now I had my first job in New York and I needed to get a permanent apartment. The IHOUSE situation is only when you are a student and since my internship was ending and thus ending my academic career for undergrad, I had to move out. So I ended up finding an apartment 
up in the Upper West Side, which is really, again, another term for probably just kind of Harlem. And this apartment was a five bedroom, again with quotation marks, because it was really a two bedroom with three closets. And I often see these TikToks where they're like, I live in the smallest apartment in New York. And I'm like, I lived in that apartment. This is my story. My bedroom could only fit a twin size bed. That's it. There was like a small like corner that had like a, a door on it that was kind of a closet, but it was a closet for a very small person, like maybe put in like in the 1920s. It had like a clothing rack that like normal hangers wouldn't fit in. It was, it was not really a functioning closet. So I had this bed and um, man, I was so proud of it. I was so proud of this apartment. And it was like, I think I paid like $800, $900 a month for this thing. Literally a closet in a not so great neighborhood, sharing with like five other people with one bathroom. You know, that's, that was New York. We also had cockroaches and mice. So we had pets, we were, we were classy. <laughs> we did name our mice. Bartholomew, Bartholomew the mouse. And I bet you there was like actually 50 mice, but every single one of them we called Bartholomew. It was a little bit of a dump. My dad came to visit once and he, you know, had, when he was visiting, pretended it was really great. But in later years, his sons told me that he was concerned for me because <laughs> the place was such a shithole. <laughs> he's like, I just, he's like, I just I kept my mouth shut. And I was like, I got out of there, dad, don't worry. But this is where I lived and I was so proud of it. And what I remember most about this time is I had gone through my internship where I wasn't making any money, but I was still expected to pay for food and housing and everything. So I was literally broke, broker than broke, like so broke. And I would show up to anything that offered free food or free drink. You got a pizza, your girl is there. You got free wine, your girl is there. Because I did have a monthly pass on that Metro, that subway, and I could get anywhere for, with that monthly pass. And since I had to have it for work, I might as well use it to get free pizza and wine. And um, I spent a lot of time, actually part of this time, I was still a little bit religious and wasn't drinking. We'll talk about that in another video. But for most of the time, I was really just actually seeking out hors d'oeuvres or pizza wherever I could get free food because I was broke. Um, I, also, <laughs> I also said yes to a lot of really interesting work things that nobody else wanted to go to. Looking back, I probably wouldn't go to these things now, but I actually made some interesting friends, which I think would be a fun future video to talk about. Let me know in the comments if you wanna hear about it. One of them that ended up leading to me being a seat filler where I got to see really cool plays and stuff for free. But again, I just took every opportunity for something for free because I was broke. And what I remember is that I was incredibly happy. I did not have a lot and I was incredibly happy. And that's because you don't need money to be happy. I know it's easy for me to say that now, now that I've built a career and I finally feel financially stable for the first time in my life, but I haven't always been this way. And I remember when I was broke, when I was in that time when like I was occasionally afraid if I was going to be able to have enough money to pay rent or I'd go to like someone's birthday dinner and I'd be like, oh God, I, I don't wanna go because I might have to pay for them and then I can't afford that. Like I remember those moments in my life, but what I remember more about that time is that it just forced me to be more creative. So you don't need money to have fun. You don't need money to have experiences. What you need is creativity and resourcefulness. And I feel like in my 20s, I had so many more interesting experiences than I do even today because I was forced to be creative. And so I look at that time in my life where I like had no money as probably one of the most exciting and interesting points of my life simply because I was broke and had to be resourceful. So my first big win in New York City is kind of unbelievable. In fact, if I look back on my life and all the crazy amazing things I've done, this is the one thing in my life that I can't believe happened. Like still to this day, it feels like a dream. It feels imaginary, but it did happen to me. It is a real story and it's, it's pretty, it's pretty surprising. So when I graduated, I knew that I was gonna wanna get a master's degree. And I'd always dreamed of going to an Ivy League university. In fact, when I was a kid, that was like what I would always say. But 
As some of you know who have watched my channel for a long time, I did not graduate high school. So even the fact that I was able to get into college is kind of like a miracle. So I wasn't like, I was like, I've got my one miracle. I'm not going to get another. So I knew that if I was going to get into an Ivy League university for my master's program, I was going to have to like be very impressive. I needed to have a great resume. I needed to have great grades. I needed to have a great GRE score, all of those things. And as part of this process and kind of building the case for me to go to an Ivy League school, I needed to meet with the chairman and kind of some students there. It's part of the process of you know interviewing for grad school. So I met um, a friend in the I House who actually was like, oh, I'm in this program. It sounds like the program you need. It was the Quantitative Methods and Social Sciences program at Columbia. And I was like, that's exactly what I want. It's a mix of sociology and numbers, kind of like me. I both left brain and right brain. This is perfect. So she set up interviews with me. I went and had the interview and I walked away from this being like, oh my gosh, this is where I need to go to school. I need to be in this program. And I remember sitting down with the chairman and being like, all I want to study is how social media is affecting social norms. And at that point in time, social media was a new kind of thing in people's lives. Like now everybody's on it all the time. But back then it was just starting to happen and social cues were changing and I was fascinated by it and I wanted to research it. So I remember talking to him passionately about that topic and then going back and being just really resolved to get a great score on the GRE. So I bought this massive GRE book and I, and I literally was starting the process of studying it, looking for GRE classes because then you got to go to school to then get into a school. It's the master's and doctorate programs are a mess, but you know. If you're in, if you've ever had a master's or a doctorate, you know. So I was like opening this massive book and I was literally sat down to begin my studying for the GRE and I get a call and it's the chairman of the program. And he goes, we'd like you to come to Columbia and, and study here. And I remember being like, I haven't applied, sir. I have not applied to your program. Uh, I don't know how you're offering me a spot in your school when I have not applied. And he goes, you know, and I literally thought it was a joke or that he was going to give me advice on how to, you know, apply correctly with essays because there's all kinds of stuff you have to do when you're applying, right? And he goes, no, I, 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 we would like you to attend this year. And I was like, this year? He's like, actually, this semester, which was like August when this happened and the semester started in September. And I was like, and I was like, sir, I haven't even taken the GRE. Like I don't have meet like any of the requirements to actually even be able to apply. And he goes, it, it doesn't matter. We're willing to waive the GRE for you. Someone that we had in our program lost their visa and we just really feel passionate about what you want to study. Um, we'd like you to come. And I remember sitting there being like, I'm finally getting my life on track. Do I really want to go into a master's program right now? And not just any master's program, a data analysis master's program at one of the hardest universities in the freaking world. And I remember sitting there being like overwhelmed and I walked up to the campus on the weekend. And as soon as I just like stepped in there, I just knew that like this was my opportunity and that like maybe next year I wouldn't be so interesting. Maybe this was my only shot and I did it. I signed up and I started grad school a month after I ended my undergrad with no plan and no understanding of how I would ever do it or that I would ever be accepted. And when I look back at it now, in that moment, it seemed very foreign. But what I do know about that experience is I had a dream and I let everybody know that that was my dream. And that allowed me to focus on it and it allowed people to know how resolved I was to do it. So I didn't get into the program just because they liked my personality. I got into the program because I shared my dream with them and they were excited about that dream too. So I would say that it's very shocking and sometimes overwhelmingly exciting how powerful it can be to just let your dreams be known because people will come and help you, but you gotta let them know how. So with that guys, thank you so much for listening. That is all my first times in New York and all the things I've learned. So with that, have an amazing rest of your day. I'll check you later and peace.